here at University of Miami, and he has significant research in the area of hepatology. Today, he's going to present ACLF, an unknown unknown. Please welcome Dr. Van Midimari. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so continuing with the series of uh, updates in medicine, the topic I chose today for hepatology is ACLF, which is acute and chronic liver failure, a known unknown. So to base my uh, talk on uh, the topic, I'm going to talk about the case. I'm going to discuss about what makes ACLF unique, pathophysiology of ACLF, the scoring and biomarkers that are available, and evolving strategies, which includes immunonutrition. So this is a patient who we saw about uh, one and a half years ago, uh, late 2016, a 39-year-old Caucasian man who presented with jaundice for three weeks, hematemesis, confusion, acute kidney injury. He presented to the outside hospital. He was briefly intubated, underwent an endoscopy and banding for the variceal bleed. Uh, he also had two sessions of renal replacement therapy, and he was then stabilized and transferred to UMH for further management. His past medical history was significant for depression and arthritis. Surgery was a, a right hip replacement for a vascular necrosis in the past. Uh, he had significant history of heavy drinking, more than uh, six glasses of wine every day, and his medications mainly included narcotics for the hip pain. So on physical exam, he had uh, low blood pressure. His heart rate was 98, and he was deeply ecteric. He had moderate ascites, grade three hepatic encephalopathy, and two plus edema. So on day one of uh, University of Miami Hospital, you can see that he had leukocytosis, he was anemic. His creatinine improved uh, over the next few days with uh, volume resuscitation and albumin. However, his bilirubin and INR uh, were quite elevated for the next three days, and obviously his MEL score remained at around uh, uh, 29 to 30. All the septic workup for this patient was negative thus far. So uh, this is a classic presentation of uh, acute and chronic liver failure. The concept of ACLF was first introduced in 95. However, there are several variations since then. The current definition of ACLF, this is based on the Eastland ASLD, is there's an acute deterioration of a pre-existing chronic liver disease. It usually happens due to a precipitating event or a trigger that leads to increased mortality within the next three months and is usually due to multi-organ uh, failures. And again, what is more importantly noted in the recent past is cirrhosis need not be present for the diagnosis of ACLF. Any patient with chronic liver disease is at risk for ACLF. And as you can see here, that there are at least 13 definitions, several variations. These are just different societies. This is the Asia Pacific Society for Liver Disease. This is a European North American and the World Gastroenterology Association. And you can see the basis for uh, ACLF definition is quite varied. Some of them are consensus, some of them are based on prospective observational studies. And the criteria for organ failure also tends to differ among the various societies. Whatever is the definition, what remains uh, constant among all these uh, ACLF presentation is it's quite distinct from acute decompensation of cirrhosis because in acute decompensation, you do not have other organ failure, but ACLF does present with other organ failure, and therefore, there is significant difference in mortality between the two entities. And this is the difference. All the other organs that can get affected in ACLF are renal, cardiovascular, coagulation, neurologic, and pulmonary failure, apart from the liver failure. And what you can see here is the mortality at one month and three months in a patient with no ACLF is quite distinct from those with one organ, two organ, or more than three organ failures, and it approaches at least 75% at the end of one month. So what happens in ACLF is there is this vicious cycle where there is hepatocyte death from the acute injury that leads to liver failure due to a series of inflammatory markers. What is now known is the impaired hepatic regeneration is probably more deleterious than the actual liver injury. And this sets off a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which is hallmark in ACLF, and that leads to other organ failures. 
And with other organ failures, there's toxin accumulation, and with toxin accumulation, the perpetual cycle continues, and that results in ACLF. So when you look at inflammation, how it's mediated in ACLF patients, inflammation can be mediated by pathogens that basically signal uh, these molecules called PAMPs, or there is a dying or a stressed cell that basically leads to signaling of endogenous signals, which are called DAMPs. Both of them can lead to inflammation and can result in ACLF. So in ACLF, regardless of what the trigger is, whether there is an infection or sterile inflammation, typical response is the systemic inflammatory response, which then triggers an adaptive immune response, which is also called CARS, or compensatory anti-inflammatory response. So if the adaptive response takes over, the surge will resolve, and the patient can have an uncomplicated outcome. If the acute injury is very heavy, like severe sepsis, this will basically lead to early organ failure and infections. But what happens in ACLF is the patient can have the resolution of SIRS, but it eventually leads to immune paralysis or uh, dysregulation of counter uh, anti-inflammatory response, and that leads to delayed infections, delayed multi-organ failure, poor outcomes, and the patient can die. So again, what is the role of inflammation versus sepsis? We now know that sepsis only accounts for 30% of the cause of ACLF. And you can see all the laundry list of uh, infections that can happen in these patients. One of the things that is important is intervention related to iatrogenic infections play a major role. Septic patients typically have very high ACLF scores, high circulatory, pulmonary, and cerebral failures. And we know that at, uh, in septic patients, the mortality is about fourfold higher than in those without. Now, if you look at sterile inflammation, uh, infection need not be present. And this is actually quite commoner than patients who present with sepsis. So what are the causes of what triggers sterile inflammation? Is alcohol in most patients, uh, GI bleeding, gut dysbiosis, which is due to ammonia or uh, bacterial lipopolysaccharide. So there is no actual inflammation, no actual infection, but there is inflammation that can stimulate excess PAMPs and DAMPs, and that results in excess mortality. So how can ammonia lead to inflammation in ACLF? This is a nice study that was published in 2016. If you look at patients without encephalopathy and with encephalopathy, and you see that the patients who have mechanisms to, who cannot lower ammonia levels actually did not survive. Whereas if you look at patients who have mechanisms where ammonia level was lowered, the patients were uh, able to survive, and this even happened in patients without encephalopathy. So again, this is to emphasize that ammonia can be a mediator of sterile inflammation in patients with ACLF. So how to assess ACLF? We know that the CPT score and the MEL score, which do not include other organs, are simply not enough to prognosticate uh, the survival in these patients. So therefore, we need to apply the CLIF scores, which includes either acute decomposition or ACLF, because it includes organ failure, and it also includes WBC and age. And now, all these calculators are available online. You just need to plug in the numbers, and it generates the score. So for example, this is the uh, ACLF score in our patient who had a bilirubin of 44, uh, who had a creatinine of 1.2, and it basically generates an ACLF grade of 2. What it also gives is the probability of dying uh, for this patient who is 39 years old. And if you look at the one-month mortality, it's about 24%. And if you look at uh, one-year mortality, it's about 55%. So there are biomarkers, which is also evolving. And uh, these biomarkers appear to be quite distinct in patients who have cirrhosis versus acute decompensation versus ACLF. So again, there is a lot of research going on in this regard. And uh, it's very important how uh, it evolves in the near future. So if we have a patient with ACLF and we look at the different management strategies, so obviously the definitive management is liver transplantation. However, we know that most patients do not actually make up to the list, either because they're too sick or they have active alcoholism or other comorbid conditions. Even patients who actually end up on the list 
50% of them die before getting a liver transplantation. So therefore, really, uh, the need is to uh, administer specific treatments in patients who have alcohol, hepatitis B, autoimmune hepatitis, drug-induced liver injury, uh, hepatic encephalopathy. There are specific treatments that we can administer. For those that do not have obvious triggers, there is an obvious role for bridge therapies, which I'm going to talk about in the, ne in the next few slides, which includes GCSF or Procrit and also the availability of extracorporeal devices. Obviously, in the general management, nutrition is very important. Uh, early diagnosis of organ failure and treatment is important. Uh, we need to treat the precipitating cause, refer the patient to transplant center, and we, have, we need to employ uh, preventive strategies. So to keep it succinct, we can see that malnutrition is multifactorial and is universal in all patients with ACLF. So as the child pew score worsens, or as the patient goes from chronic hepatitis to cirrhosis to ACLF, we see that lipids become the preferred substrate in these patients. So we can employ IV lipids as part of nutrition in these patients, and we have come a long way since 1920, uh, where we first used castor oil as uh, an IV lipid emulsion. And in 1990s, we used soybean and olive oil, which is a third generation IV lipids. But since 2000, what we now know is nutrition can not only just be for energy supplier, but also it can modulate immunity. And since 2008, we now have omega-3, which is an important IV lipid emulsion that uh, can be employed in these patients. I also want to emphasize that not all IV lipid emulsions are the same. So the soybean oil, which is rich in omega-6, tends to be more pro-inflammatory and is not recommended in critically ill patients. However, fish oils, which is rich in omega-3, and olive oil that's rich in omega-9, happens to be more immune neutral and less pro-inflammatory. Do we have any data on this matter? Obviously, there is there is very sparse data. This is one randomized controlled trial looking at 51 patients who did not have sepsis or shock or acute kidney injury. This was presented in last year ASLD. Uh, Three-fourths of them were active alcohol users. And if you look at the preclinical outcomes, omega-3 tend to have much favorable uh, outcomes in terms of reducing the pro-inflammatory markers. If you look at clinical outcomes, sepsis was statistically low in patients who received omega-3 versus uh, omega-6 or uh, uh, other parental nutrition. The mortality, however, did not make any statistical difference at the end of one month. What about GCSF uh, or Neupogen? We know that it stimulates neutrophils and macrophages, but it also can mobilize dendritic cells, CD34 cells, and hepatic progenitor cells that can help with uh, regeneration of the liver. So this is looking at a liver biopsy with CD34 stain prior to GCSF, and it's about 30% staining versus post-GCSF, you can see that the increased mob mobilization of CD34 cells into the liver tissue that will help with hepatic regeneration. Does it translate into clinical outcomes? Uh, it appears it does, because patients who received GCSF obviously had lower rates of hepatorenal syndrome, had lower rates of hepatic encephalopathy and sepsis, and also patients who receive GCSF tend to have better survival compared to those with placebo. However, we cannot give GCSF or we cannot expect that all patients who receive GCSF would respond. So how we can uh, know if a patient would respond? Obviously, a bone marrow biopsy could better delineate, although it may be quite tricky in a patient who is sick. But a bone marrow biopsy that is high in osteoblasts, high in CD34 cells, low fibrosis and low vascularity tends to be a better responder to GCS of treatment. And those with non-response typically are the septic patients, sarcopenic, anemic, and those with acute kidney injury or hemos, uh, hemophagocytic syndrome. So what else can we do for these patients? Obviously, we do have extracorporeal liver assist devices. The MARS and the plasmapheresis devices have been studied in the past. What we have at University of Miami and Jackson is uh, an ELAD, which is the extracorporeal liver assist device. This is an ongoing trial, which is almost fully enrolled. So we put this patient on uh, ELAD for about five days. The advantage for uh, ELAD in this patient is it actually 
uh, gives a 400 grams of hepatocyte mass that would theoretically help with hepatic regeneration in ACLF. So back to our case. So this patient, after five days of ELAD, obviously had a modest improvement in bilirubin to up to 30, and INR remained at around 1.7. His MEL score uh, decreased modestly from 30 to 25. At the end of six months, you can see that there is a significant drop in his bilirubin to 3.6, and his MEL score is 13. However, at the end of one year, we saw that his bilirubinemia worsened, and that when we tested for blood alcohol levels, obviously the patient has relapsed, uh, and this was on three serial blood tests. Uh, and now that I see this patient, he quit drinking again, he continues to follow up in my clinic, and he also follows psychiatry and nutrition. So obviously when we take care of a cirrhotic patient who's hospitalized or who's critically ill, we need to make a differentiation whether this is acute decompensation or ACLF. We need to apply these scores, and if we see a patient that just has acute decompensation and no organ failure, this is a patient who can undergo liver transplantation if the MELD is more than 30 and he's already listed, or medical management would suffice and he can just follow up in the clinic. If the patient has ACLF grade 1 where there is kidney injury, most patients would just be okay with liver transplantation, but sometimes we make a case for simultaneous liver kidney based on uh, the severity of the kidney injury. If there is ACLF grade two, where there is circulatory and respiratory failure and other organ failure, obviously this patient is most likely going to be septic and uh, uh, we need to uh, intensify his medical management and bridge therapies do have a role in this situation. We need to stabilize and liver transplantation can be on a case by case basis. Once the patient has grade three, this patient needs to be stabilized and we need to reassess. Aggressive ICU and supportive therapy needs to be instituted. This patient could be too sick for liver transplantation and we can probably refer him to our next speaker, Juan, who's gonna talk about palliative care. <laughs> so uh, on a good note, we know that uh, we do quite well and this is data from 2002 to 2010, looking at about 780,000 patients who are hospitalized uh, for acute decomposition of ACLF, and there is a decrease in mortality in the past decade, and I hope that this trend will continue in uh, most of the transplant centers in the United States. So my take-home messages, uh, ACLF, the concept is unknown, however, the concept is well known for uh, since 1995, however, the definition for ACLF varies based on different societies. There is now a push for uniformity of definition across but what is important is we need to recognize organ failure, we need to apply the uh, cliff scores wherever it's needed, and we need to document that this is acute decomposition or ACLF because the mortality is quite different. In the pathophysiology, we know that sepsis accounts for only 30%, but there are several unknown factors that trigger sterile inflammation. These can be not just hepatic insult, but these could be non-hepatic insult as ammonia, GI bleed, or gut dysbiosis. Most patients in this condition do succumb to immune paralysis that happens at a later stage. Management needs to be quick and judicious. Uh, too sick can mean too late. Liver transplantation is life-saving, but only it happens in uh, a few. Biomarkers, immune nutrition, and bridge therapies are evolving, and they, they appear to be promising. Probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, fecal uh, microbiota transplantation, and stem cells, uh, which is close to Dr. Weiss. There's very sparse data in this regard, and uh, we hope that more and more research is needed for treating this ACLF. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bimonardi. That was a very nice review. Uh, while people are thinking of questions, let me begin by asking, it doesn't seem to make a difference what the initial cause of the liver dysfunction is, according to what you say. But, but are there? But some can be cirrhotic. They don't have to be cirrhotic. Is there any way to predict which liver, which, uh, the, whether the cause of the initial liver problem will result in this or not? So most of the data in ACLF uh, was from the Southeast Asia where typically they wanted, they, they looked at patients who had a hepatic insult, which is a viral, viral reactivation, hepatitis B. 
But what we recognize more and more in the Eastern, uh, uh, the differences between the Eastern and the Western is sterile inflammation, alcohol tends to be more. So again, for alcohol, early treatment with steroids, early treatment and recognizing the precipitating factor, which could be infections, GI bleeds, these tend to become more important. So again, to answer your question, recognizing the trigger and probably before the systemic inflammation starts, before the SIRS actually uh, becomes quite severe, if you administered all the specific treatments, these patients tend to do well. So early referral to a hepato your friendly hepatologist. Correct. Okay. Dr. Martin. Come on. Right. So that is, that is a very good question, and that is where most of the challenge is, because the, if you look at all the ACLF studies, the prognosis of how a patient would do at the end of, uh, from the presentation to the end of one week makes a big difference. So by the end of one week, we do have counter uh, anti-inflammatory response, but again, the hallmark for ACLF is all immune paralysis. So these patients can succumb to a later infection. So I think uh, when a patient first presents, uh, we are quite judicious. We can employ the use of antibiotics. But uh, if the patient is not doing well, this is a patient who probably should continue on antibiotics versus if a patient continues to do well, we should look at bridge therapies and immune modulatory treatments. Would you say hepatorenal syndrome is a form of, of this? It's just that it's the, the kidney is the only one that's being uh, manifested as abnormal. A, uh, HRS is probably a, a consequence of ACLF. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, the next presenter is Dr. Palacios. He is the, uh, currently the clinical director of the Hospice and Palliative Care Program at Miami Bay Hospital. And actually now uh, ranks also a position as assistant professor of clinical medicine. Uh, Dr. Palacios obtained his medical degree from the uh, University of San Andres at Bolivia. And he completed his uh, internal medicine residency in Greater Baltimore Medical Center to later uh, pursue a fellowship in geriatric medicine here at University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospital. Today, Dr. Palacios will present the title of What Should I Know About Palliative Care and Hospice? Thank you. That was a great case presentation. I'm going to use this. Hello. 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 Why have to turn it on? Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. You make it difficult for me now, so let's go for it. Uh, I work in the Miami VA. I'm a full-time um, uh, palliative care physician right now. I'm in charge of the program, and I'm going to be talking about palliative care. There are some basic definitions that I want to, to, to make sure that everyone leaves this, uh, this, uh, this place knowing about it. So um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to do an overview on palliative care. If we have time, I might talk on a hot topic in palliative care now, which is communication and goals of care conversations, but I don't think we're going to have, we just have 20 minutes. So, let's start. Um, let's see, how do I, I should be here, right? Yes, this is the one. Um, I'm going to start this presentation uh, talking to you about a case that I had a few months ago. This patient I met in, uh, um, well, 72-year-old, history of congestive heart failure. He had uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, admitted to the hospital for uh, acute exacerbation of CHF, and also he had atrial fibrillation with RBR. Admitted to one of the units, and I get to meet him on the 67th day of admission when he had a cardiac arrest. And at that point, I get a palliative care consult, hospice consult, to see this patient. 
go to one of the units, he survived the CPR, he is intubated on a bunch of pressors, and now I have to deal with this case. Okay? It's still happening. That's why I'm back here and we're going to talk about palliative care. So, uh, we talk about my objectives. So, I'm going to uh, start with the definition of palliative care. Uh, it is a, an approach of care, a form of care, to be concentrated on quality of life and symptoms. What is important, and this is what I want you to take from here, that palliative care is different than hospice. And when we're talking about palliative care, we are talking about the care on any stage of the disease, from diagnosis to any stage which could be death. So any life-limiting disease, any chronic disease can get palliative care no matter where in the disease stage we are. Now, and this is also very important, when we are talking about palliative care, these patients can have any other treatments. They can seek curative treatments. They can look into life-prolonging treatments. So that's a big difference with hospice. Now, how or what we do when we see patients on palliative care, our approach is more what in geriatrics do. It's a global approach. We look into all the domains, not only the medical domain. We leave the oncologist to be worried about the cancer. We leave the cardiologist to worry about the CHF. We look at the whole patient as a whole. And our goal is for the patient to keep hope, dignity, and autonomy. And our role is to work not only with the patients, but also with the families. So that is, in summary, palliative care. Again, any time during the disease, and patients can be looking into prolonging or curative treatments. Let's talk about hospice. Oh, before we go into that, I want to go and talk about this. I call it three steps. In the VA, we are very much up into the upstreaming. And this is what I want to talk today. Primary PC, which means primary palliative care. Who should be doing primary palliative care? Every clinician that's seeing a patient. Don't wait to the specialist in palliative care to come and talk about advanced directives. This is your patient, and we're going to talk about that. Yes, a specialist can be called any time, so I'm going, to, I'm going to give you some guidelines when you should call me, and then we'll talk about hospice. Now, when we talk about hospice, this is limited prognosis. We're talking about less than six months. So let's concentrate on primary palliative care. Uh, so, like I said before, any clinician, doesn't need to be a physician, RMP, PA, that is seeing a patient should approach primary palliative care. That's the upstreaming. What should they provide? Basic symptom management and advanced care planning. That is something that every physician should be committed to do. Okay? Like, let me give you an example. If you have a patient, you're a cardiologist, and you are seeing these patients for the past six years for CHF, and uh, you've been treating him, you are doing great treatments for him, or you are an oncologist and you are doing the same, and then you call me to do a palliative care consult, and when I talk to the patient, I'm the one that is telling him that his disease is incurable, that his disease is end, that he is at the end stage, how do you feel as a patient? Which conversation you think is going to be better? That I go, yes, I was trained on communication. But who on the patient? The cardiologist, the oncologist that knows him for several years. So which conversation you think is going to get better? My conversation or your conversation on someone who's known the patient better? Okay. So this is something fundamental. This is upstreaming. You know, there are 6,000, I believe, 500 palliative care physicians specialized in the United States. Do you think that we can do all the goals of care of all these patients that need goals of care? It's impossible. There's no way that can be done. So who has to do it? The clinician, primary care, 
or a specialist. Now, this is, the, this is, the, this is me, specialist in palliative care. So uh, when do we call a specialist in, primary care, or in palliative care? First is complex conditions. God, what's a complex conditions? I don't know if um, uh, you have the experience when, when I was seeing patients in the clinic, in the morning I will come and look at my list of patients that I have to see. And I'll go on my, my list and I'll look at my list and I'll see and I'll like, the moment that you see a patient and you feel, oh my goodness, Mr. Jones, he has such a complicated disease. He is so difficult. And his family, oh my goodness, that's the patient for palliative care. This is a complex case. This is a patient that the specialist in palliative care can help you to manage. Now, what I consider myself, I consider myself an extra layer of support. What I mean by this, when I approach a conversation in palliative care, the first thing that I tell the patient and the family is, I'm here to help you go through your disease. I'm not here to replace your oncologist, your nephrologist, your hepatologist. I'm not here to replace anyone. I am an extra liar to help you coordinate your care, your, 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 your care in all levels of care. This is an approach not only for patients, but also for families. Now, the next step is hospice. Hospice is a subset of palliative care, but it's completely different to what we've just been speaking so far. So what is hospice? Again, it's a philosophy of care, symptom management, and quality of care, pretty much what palliative care is. However, these are patients that have to have a life expectancy less than six months, and they are not pursuing life-prolonging treatments. So, this is the example. I get called for a, for, a, for a palliative care consult, and the team tells me this patient has a creatinine of nine. He's becoming uremic. I think he meets criteria for hospice. And the next thing I know, the families and the patient is telling me he's going to go on dialysis. Dialysis is a life-prolonging treatment. So that patient, even though with a creatinine of nine, will not meet criteria for hospice. Okay? Now, um, if there is something that you want to take from here, remember this. I, I, took, I took this from one of the talks, I think, one of your talks, and this is something that helps me all the time. And my thinking is, any hospice care patient is palliative, but not every palliative care patient is hospice. Let's keep going on this. Um, um, okay, so I'm going to go back on this. I got the, the, wrong, the wrong presentation, but that's okay. We'll go back on those. Um, let's talk about a couple of studies here. Who hasn't seen this study? It's been there for a few years now. An early palliative care for patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. It's been out there. Probably everyone knows about it. I think this is what started early palliative care. Because pretty much what happened in this study is they, they, they had two groups. In one group, they put regular oncologic care on this metastatic lung cancer. And on the other group, they put regular oncologic care past palliative care. And their outcomes were quality of life, mood, uh, healthcare services use, and survival. And what it showed, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, what they showed was that uh, there was some um, improvement definitely on quality of life. Then when it comes to, to mood, they look to anxiety and depression. You can see it here. And the conclusion was also that there was an improvement on depression, not much on anxiety. And that was not because the patients were getting more antidepressants, because as you can see, the antidepressants were exactly the same amount on both groups. But this was the biggest one. There was a difference on survival, okay, at least in this study. 8.9 months to 11 point. So there was a survival difference of 2.7 months. So in summary, this study showed better quality of life, fewer depressive symptoms, and prolonged 2.7 more months of survival. So then we're talking about early. So then I said, how early is early? Is early good? 
Let's look at this. And then I found this study, which is the Enable 3. And this uh, is also a randomized study that looks into early versus late palliative care. And what they did on this is, in this study, they, all these patients were oncologic patients. They had a prognosis between 6 to 24 months, and they put them on two groups. One group was, at the time of the study started, we start palliative care. And then the second group was, three months later, again, palliative care. So everyone in this study got palliative care. The only difference is that one group got it earlier, the other one got it later. And their outcomes were quality of life, symptom management, mood, survival, and resource use, exactly like the other study. What is interesting in this study, though, is that, um, let me see, let me take a thought, that um, there was no difference on early versus delayed on quality of life, symptom impact, and mood. And when it comes to resources, there was also no difference on use of hospital intensive, intensive care or emergency visits, as you can see. What was different, again, was the survival. The one-year survival, there was a 15% improvement on this study. So I was talking with one of the faculty in, the, in, in, in Jerry, and I asked, oh, this, this looks like kind of a negative study. Should I really present it? I'm talking about palliative care. I'm trying to convince you to, to, to refer to palliative care. But then we start talking with, with Ross about this, and she says, look at this. Number one, everyone got palliative care, right? Number two, the early group lived longer, but the resource utilization was less. So it is not, I mean, you can still see that palliative care will have a difference when it comes to survival and other resource utilization. Now, let's talk about, um, this is the, the chart on that. Let's talk about um, systematic reviews. Okay, who likes systematic reviews? I don't, I hate to read them. Too complicated for me. God, anyway, but you know, you, you gotta do what you gotta do. And this is a systematic review that was, uh, that included 12 studies, 10 were RCTs, about 2,500 patients. Most of them were cancer. And uh, they were looking at um, uh, pretty much um, quality of life. They were looking at, um, um, where the quality of life is, I think it's, I don't, know what, I don't know what happened with my slides. Okay, this is coming up. Okay, so they were looking at quality of, uh, pre pretty much the two, the, the primary outcome was quality of life and the secondary outcome was symptoms. So let's look at this. As you can see here, on one side we have favoring specialized versus just standard care. Now, um, there was, um, when it comes to all these studies, as you can see, there's some difference. And I'm gonna use this, I see, if I, I see if I can manage all these things together. Some difference positive to quality of life on those, on most of the studies. This study was not taken in account in this, uh, in this chart because it was a very favorable study and they didn't, they didn't want to make the heterogeneity affected by that. But the, 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 the summary of this is that there was some difference on, positive difference on quality of life in most of the studies. Now, when it comes to what type of patients did we have, we have the cancer patients and non-cancer patients. And again, we see some small difference in favor to the cancer patients versus the non-cancer patients. Again, the, the CHF patient was or the CHF study was excluded. And finally, we have early versus non-early. And again, some small difference uh, that was favored to the early palliative care versus non-early palliative care. So, in summary, okay, I'm having problems with my, my slides. In summary, this is the, the, the conclusion of the study. Palliative care was associated with a small effect on quality of life. This was more pronounced on patients who had cancer, and it was most effective if it was provided early than later. Okay. 
So those are the, the, the three studies that I brought for you on palliative care. Now I'm going to uh, keep going and talking about uh, what happened with my hospice. Okay, so this is a completely different situation now. We're talking about hospice. Okay, so when someone, when you are considering a hospice, hospice services for a patient, the first thing that you need to think is number one, does the patient meet eligibility criteria? And the eligibility criteria, you find it, there's a Medicare guidelines on every disease that is out there that will give you guidelines who meets criteria or not when it comes to hospice. But it's not only that. Patient has to be eligible and he has to agree with hospice services. Okay? And this is because of insurance issues. So once the patient meets criteria and agrees with hospice, then we're going to think about who is going to be paying for that and what kind of services we're going to be providing. Now, when we have a patient and we need to place him in different uh, levels of care, depending on their social support, their function, or their symptoms, there are many options that we can choose when it comes to hospice. So who pays for hospice? Hospice is mainly paid by Medicare, but also Medicaid and private insurance will pay for hospice. When it comes to all the levels that we could use hospice, the most widely used is home. So it's home plus hospice services. And the average uh, amount of money that Medicare will pay per day on those patients is about $162 a day. If we feel that the patient needs to go to an ALF or nursing home, it will be the same rate because it will be like home services. Whereas if the patient has symptoms that need to be admitted into an inpatient unit, the rates are about $740 a day on those admissions. Definitely much cheaper what we spend in an ICU, much cheaper than what we spend in an acute medical service, definitely. Now, most of the patients that are in hospice might want to die at home. So what hospice can provide at home? What we call crisis care, 24-7 care at home. What this means? A nurse will go and spend 24-7 at the house and provide hospice services. Now, these services are only for patients who are actively dying. And um, usually uh, the amount of money that uh, Medicare will recognize for that is about $900. Medicare also will recognize for respite. So if you have a hospice patient that needs, that the caregiver is pretty much overwhelmed and the caregiver needs respite, respite is covered. There's five days per certification and that's the rate for a day. So who provides hospice? Uh, UMH works with VITAS, so there are profit and non-profit organizations that will provide hospice. So a classic profit probably is VITAS, non-profit probably Catholic, but there are so many other ones that you can, that you can uh, use. When we're talking about uh, services, uh, the hospice agency will cover anything that is related to the qualifying, I, I know Dr. Zoe doesn't like qualifying the eligibility criteria for hospice, okay? So anything that is related to the disease has to be paid by the hospice agency. So what happens if the patient has other comorbidities and the patient is still willing to be managed for that? Let's say if the patient has diabetes or he has hypertension and he wants to keep taking his medicines, which I think it's, I mean, hospice, and, and this I want to be very clear for the house staff, hospice doesn't mean do not, do not treat. DNR doesn't mean do not treat, okay? We still treat this. When this needs to be treated, hospice will not take care of those and does need to go fee for service. So then they will need to see the primary care physician or whoever is writing for this, usually we, in the palliative care unit we will, or clinic, we will help them with those. Uh, so we'll be more uh, a complete care when it comes to treatment of, uh, of these patients. Um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna go back because I had a couple of slides that just backed up on this, and this is the summary I wanted to go back, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened with my, my slides. These are the two that I wanna go, and these are my summary slides. So, number one, palliative care and hospice. As you can see here, there is no difference when it comes to what they do. Both will maximize quality of life, they will help symptom management, they'll help you on clarifying advanced care planning, goals of care, and all of this. There is absolutely no difference on that. The difference is at what point of the disease you're gonna apply palliative care versus when you're gonna be doing hospice. So if we're talking about um, um, palliative care, as I said before, it is at any point of the disease from diagnosis to death. And patients can use prolonging or curative treatments. And I'm repeating this because this is important for me. There's no limitation on treatments and hospitalizations. Whereas in hospice, as I gave you the example with the, with the dialysis patients, they might, there has to be some uh, uh, going or some life prolonging treatments. And we still admit patients if they need to and we need to follow the criteria by Medicare of life expectancy less than six months. Now, when it comes to payment, as you can see here, um, who pays for hospice? Hospice has what we call a package deal, right? So all these services, whoever is paying either Medicare, insurance, or Medicaid will pay a fee and that fee has to be used for all services that are going to be provided. This will last as long as the patient is eligible for hospice, and it can be provided anywhere where the, the patient resides, meaning if he's living in a nursing home, is he's living in an ALF, is living at home, it will be provided there. Whereas palliative care, as you can see, it is not like this. Now, I was thinking like, could I survive if I have a palliative care clinic of my own with my overhead? There's no way I could survive having a clinic in the community doing palliative care, okay? So palliative care probably, uh, I, definitely I will survive in a hospital or a system like this. There's a lot of consultation. I could survive doing this. So mostly this is a service for either a clinic that is dependent of a big system, VA, UMH, uh, patients that are uh, in, 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 I don't think like I can have a private practice of palliative care only. Now, something important, and I, I have one of my friends from oncology keeps his patients to the end. You know, he does palliative care, pain management, and all of this, and he keeps them to the point where like they are ready to go to hospice. And one day I stop and say, say, man, what's going on with you? Why you keep your patients? till the end when they're ready to like go to hospice and just die in the next few days. And he told me, the moment I send a patient to hospice, I lose my patient. I cannot give chemo anymore, okay? And that is true, okay? You cannot give any more chemotherapy. So that's the reason that in the community, that doesn't happen here in our institution, that doesn't happen where I work, but in the community, you know, you build up your clinic, you build up your practice. The moment that you don't, you don't have that, that is a big deal. And I think I'm, I'm going to probably stop here. I know that I, I, I I'll stop here. And have, if you have any questions, thank you, Dr. Palacio. Any questions? We have time for one. Dr. 
Mr. St. Aubrey. I'm going to be very strong on this. As, as you know, the Veterans Administration has until July this month to uh, all, all VA not start what we call life-saving treatment initiative, which is, I think I have a couple of slides on this, but it doesn't matter. Life-saving treatment uh, initiative is going to, uh, all VAs will have to uh, is, uh, have this running by July. It includes a template includes a policy, includes a specific order in the template, and education. And some of the residents know that we've been doing education on, on, on goals of care conversation. This is something that the VA is required. It's not only the template, it's not only the order, it's education. And we are very strong on the upstreaming. You know, there's not enough palliative care physicians to do this. This has to come from the cardiologist, the nephrologist. The nephrologist has to tell the patient, I don't think we can do any more analysis. This is just too much. You know, this is, we have to start there. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you both very much. For My slides got shuffled. I don't know what happened with it.